have you all here this morning. Let's read our card first. Very special thank you for your thoughtfulness. Thank you so much for the beautiful floral arrangement, Carol Johnson and family. Thank you, and you're welcome. <laughs> Let's see what we got here. Philip Burkert has Parkinson's. Joyce is to have her electrostimulator reinserted August 26th. <laughs> Probably. Uh, we've got two friends, okay? And one of them is having surgery this week. And the other one has a tumor, which we have to identify and, uh, you know, plan an attack. And so, you don't know who this is, so don't look around and wonder who it is. <laughs> they don't even go here. Okay. I want to pray for Billy Thomas. He's got uh, to figure out whether or not he's going to go for another hitch in the military. He can either uh, come home and join the civilians or sign on for, how much longer does he have to sign on for if he does? I don't know what the, how long it would be. Could be four years, could be two yeah. years, could be, okay. So anyway, it's a big deal. Um, Nanico Church, Joe Roach is their pastor. Ismael Noriega of El Salvador, minister, or missionary of the week. Mary Lou Brevin is the senior of the week. Anybody else this morning? Barb. Yeah, I have a prayer request for Kathy Clark, our friend. Uh, she had a mini stroke yesterday, and she had cancer a few years back on the brain, and they took it off, and now she has mini strokes. So they took her out yesterday in an ambulance. And it's a knee now? Pardon me? What, what is it? Stroke. Stroke. She had a mini stroke. Mini stroke. Mini stroke. Mini stroke. Right. And what's the name? Kathy Clark. Kathy Clark. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Anybody else? Yeah, Betty. I think we should put Pastor Beth and his wife on the prayer list. They both were taken over Friday night by an ambulance. I don't know any more than that. I can't hear what you said. Reverend Beth and his wife. Oh, okay. Friday night in an ambulance. Oh, really? Two ambulances. Wow. Wow. Reverend and Mrs. Beth. We're evidently both hospitalized, it sounds like. Okay. Anybody else? Beth. Debbie Burns' sister. What is her name? Jane? Jane. Um, and it's cancer, right? Okay. Anybody else? I know you yes. include them in your prayers every week anyway, but uh, especially now, more than ever, the, the German and Mayfield police. Um, they have been, especially this past week, um, taking down huge dangers in town that most of us didn't even know existed. Um, they, they took down someone the other day who's uh, one of the homicide charges. Right. Um, and, and then they got about five or six other people out of that same apartment. And, uh, and, and other issues uh, that, you know, them along with the, the local DA's office and the special task forces and everything, they just, they go in harm's way every day, and yeah, like I said, stuff we don't stuff we don't even know about. Like they, they really help us sleep peacefully at night, and we don't even know about half this stuff. And they have their eyes on it, and they're taking care of it. Amen. Anybody else? All right. 
Let's turn our, turn our handles to number 72. Now let's all stand as we sing. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my 
know my thoughts. Thank you, baby. She. Let's bow our heads. We have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, what a great thing it is to gather together this morning here in your house, worship you and honor you. Lord, we live in such a wonderful place. We read about what it's like to live in a downtown Chicago or these big cities where every weekend 70 or more people are just getting shot. And they don't do anything really about it because it's normal, it's become tolerable, it's just accepted as the way it is. And Lord, where we live is so different. We are so blessed to live up here in the hinterlands, as it were. The rest of the world might think that this is uh, backwater and unimportant, but oh, we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for our police department here in this town. Because these are our neighbors, they're our friends. They show up every day, every night, while we sleep. And they see that we live in a civil and regulated society. And we know there are forces that would promote chaos and discord and disunity and actually want to disband the police department, or defund them. And our Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful that we live in a place where that there's more common sense up here than that. So again, we thank you for these men and women who show up every day and protect us, and we thank you where we live. And these are choices that we didn't make. I mean, we didn't pick to be born and live up here. These are gifts from you. And all we can say is thank you, Lord, and please help us to appreciate for you for what you've given us. We pray also this morning, Lord, for these names on our prayer list, because these are our friends and neighbors and family as well. And they have various issues like cancer and tumors and knee replacements and people recovering from surgery and people going to surgery. Just all kind of variety of things, Lord. And we know your arm is never short. We ask you to bring your healing power to bear upon each and every one. We wish you would stand up each person, fill their hearts with a sense of your grace and power and presence and make them to testify that the Lord is our healer. And likewise, our Heavenly Father, we understand that you don't want us to live forever down here in this sin-sick, dying world. you got better things prepared for us, and Christ Jesus has purchased them for us. And so, our Heavenly Father, fill our hearts with faith. Help us be strong when it's difficult. That's when it counts. So our Heavenly Father, give us perseverance, and courage, and faith, and trust, and hope, knowing that we have one, a God in heaven, who is worthy of all those things. They help us to live that life down here in this world. We pray likewise, Father, for our friends down in Nanticoke. We pray that that might be a lighthouse in that community. That they might understand that this is more than just coming and going. But they might hear your words and that they might resonate in their hearts. And when they sing to you and pray to you, that they might know that you hear from on high. And you're not disinterested in what takes place down here, but you have a vested interest in the lives of your people. We pray for Ishmael Noriega and his missionary work down there in El Salvador. We ask your deepest and richest blessing upon him. Fill him with your Holy Spirit. And fill that church with your spirit. They might worship you in and out of... Uh, church formal. Pray for our friend Mary Lou Gribble. We ask you to watch over her and comfort her soul. We pray that she would hear her voice, your voice in her heart, and know that you love her. And though life is often difficult, especially for our seniors, 
We pray that you give her courage and patience and faith. And help Don, that he might help her. We pray for all our seniors in that way. Lord, again, United States Armed Forces, again, we sleep soundly over here. But there are places in this world that are a mess. And the United States Armed Forces shows up the face of freedom, the face of liberty, the face of help. So we ask your blessing upon them. And we pray for all those who work together to make this a civil society, Lord. Every man, woman, and child who shows up each and every day in the name of Jesus Christ in whatever capacity bring your name to bear upon the darkness in this world. Lord, help us to be light. Father, we can pray all day and it be a worthy enterprise. Surely you're worthy of our prayers. We ask you to hear all these. Respond to them according to your perfect will. And for all the things hidden in our hearts, we say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we have special music from Beth Ruth. <coughs> it's quiet. Pardon? It's Lisa. Oh, it's Lisa. <laughs> She's been practicing all week, so I thought.
Lisa, that was beautiful. If Rex Oakley was here, he'd be smiling all over the place. That was my mix up. I just assumed that Beth was singing and uh, you know what happens when you make an assumption. <laughs> but I won't spell it out from here. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> you can turn me in your bulletin if you like to the inside, the left hand side. Apostle Paul writes about the remnant of Israel. Those few that are left. That's what a remnant is. Remember Paul's writing to the Romans? And among other things, he wants the church in Rome to know that both Jew and Gentile are welcome in the kingdom of God. It's for whosoever will, okay? It's not limited to God's chosen people, the Jewish nation, chosen by God to bring blessing to the whole world. They're as welcome as the Gentiles. In fact, the disobedience of the Jewish nation as a people opened the gates. The Gentiles might be welcome in the kingdom. And so Paul writes, and he wants the Jews to know, hey, don't give up heart. <coughs> Paul says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite. I am a descendant of Abraham. I am a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says about Elijah? He appeals to God against Israel. He says, Lord, they killed your prophets. They demolished your altars. And I alone am left. And they seek my life. Elijah said, I'm the only one left. But what's the Lord's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal, the God of the Canaanites. So to at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it's by grace, it's no longer in the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. And again, Lord, we're just regular people down here. You know who we are. You know where we live. You know the frustrations that we experience daily. You know our highs. The best things that happen to us in this world when we're just couldn't be happier. You know our lows. You know our strengths. You know our weaknesses. We read in our antiphonal reading, you've known us before we were even born, yea, before we were conceived. We ask you to speak to our hearts. Give us the food we need from the words of your mouth. I pray that you speak to us here this morning, that your grace and your mercy might fill our hearts, that your very spirit might guide us in this world. And we'll be grateful for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What we're talking about this morning is the idea that God will never leave nor forsake his people even unto the end of the earth. That's the word of God that he gave to Joshua when he was going to enter the promised land. He said, be strong and be of good courage. Okay? You take the things I promised you, I'll never leave you or forsake you even unto the end of the earth. When Jesus was ascending to heaven, just before, he told his apostles, go into all nations and make disciples. I will be with you always. His promises are worthy of our trust. 
He is worthy of our trust. He is worthy of all we do and say. Sometimes in this world, we feel like we're the only one left. And that the whole world has caved in, the whole world's fallen apart, the whole world's walked away. And uh, Paul quotes from Elijah here, from this great passage that I want to look at today. It's from 1 Kings, and uh, it's one of the great stories of the Bible, where Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal. The word Baal, B-A-A-L, okay? Baal was a storm god. He was supposed to be the Canaanite god who was in charge of the heavens. He was in charge of rain, thunder, lightning, okay? So Baal was the one that they would pray to. Baal was the one they would try and appease. Baal was the one they would try and get him to show his favor upon them so they would get crops. So it would rain in season and out of season and that they would have prosperity. Well, I'm just going to start with this and work our way through. Elijah had said there'd be no rain. God came to him and said, Elijah, not going to be rain for three years. Until you give the word, there'll be no rain. And Elijah was sent first, what? To a widow in Zarephath, remember? She had nothing. First God said, go, go to the, this brook, Cherith. I ordered the ravens to feed you. They'll take care of you. They'll see that all your needs are met. The ravens will bring you bread in the morning and meat at night. Elijah, you do what I tell you to do. You walk with me and I'll take care of you. I'll see your needs are met. The same is true of us here in this world, right now, right here today. God makes a distinction amongst his people. He has chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the earth that whosoever will will be a part of his family and a part of his kingdom. And he's not disinterested in our lives. He is deeply interested in what takes place every hour of every day in the life of his people. Elijah, I have ordered the ravens to feed you. <clears throat> There's a widow in Zarephath. When the ravens are done with you, Elijah, go to her. He went to this widow in Zarephath who was going to take care of her. She was dirt poor. In fact, she said, you know what? We're down to the last of the flour in the barrel. It's just me and my son. She's gathering sticks to make a fire. She said, we're going to make our last cakes. We're going to eat them. And we're out of food. We're going to die. Elijah said, you take care of me. Your barrel will never want. You take care of God's word. You take care of God's work. You take care of God's people. And you'll never want. And she, she made cakes. And the oil and the flour, they never ran out. God's been taking care of his people, what? Since the day he created the heavens and the earth. Isn't that right? When the people of Israel wandered through the wilderness, it rained bread from heaven. They said, call it manna. What is this? We can do everything with it. God's feeding us from the skies. Where, where is our livelihood? Is it any less miraculous? Is our livelihood really any less miraculous? When you were born into this world, what did you do to take care of yourself? What could you do? Somebody had to take care of you from the hour that you entered into this world. You couldn't feed yourself. You couldn't get water. You couldn't walk. Talk about life support. Every last thing in your entire existence was a matter of life support. But God raised up somebody, a mom, a dad, an aunt, an uncle, foster parents, whoever it may be, to bring you to this very hour. Where does our food and clothing and shelter come from today? You know how good it is to be healthy enough to work? Do you know what a blessing it is? Yeah, it's unbelievable. The ability to work. The ability to take care of yourself and maybe take care of a family. This world is full of people who've had things befall them that they can't do that anymore. 
God takes care of us. There was a man named Obadiah. He was faithful to the Lord, but he was a governor of King Ahab. Wicked King Ahab, right? Ahab, the husband of Jezebel, the world famous witch. When we see somebody nasty in society, we call them a Jezebel. And this Obadiah, not the prophet Obadiah, but another man, he was a governor. Because Obadiah lived in a world where he worshipped and loved God. He protected the prophets. He hid 50 of them in caves. Two caves, 50 each. The prophets of God, he hid. Well, Jezebel and Ahab were looking to kill all the prophets of the God of Israel. And yet he works in the king's palace. Do you know what that's like? To live in a world where if they knew what's really in your heart, really not welcome. We live in a world that is not interested in the kingdom of God. We live in a world that is interested in what? Taking care of number one. Taking care of myself. Making sure that I get my cut. And if it means I have to elbow you out of the way or squeeze you out of the way, that's the way it goes. It's a world of scratching and clawing and trying to get to the top. But we don't believe that's the way to live, do we? We think we ought to honor the Lord and serve Him. And take what He puts before us. Live the life that He's brought us to. Okay? We don't have to go to Africa. We don't have to go to Zambia. We don't have to build a hospital in, you know, Sri Lanka to serve the Lord. But we serve him faithfully right where we are, just like Obadiah. Well, there were 450 prophets of Baal, and I'm going to start reading from here. Ahab sent word throughout all Israel, and he assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. And Elijah went before the people, and he said, as the King James says, how long will you halt between two opinions? How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, the God of this world, the God of forces of this world, the God of nature, right? I told you last week, I know. The person I'm thinking of has got credentials that are probably better than anybody in this room. Academic credentials that are tops. And she told me one day, yes, and God is a force. But God is more than a force. He acts sometimes as a force. But he is a person. He is personal. He is something who can love and loves and wants to be loved. He's someone who can be grieved, whose feelings can be hurt, when the people he loves don't love him back. When the things he, the world he's created rejects God, it hurts him. He is personal. He is more than just a force. When they worship Baal, when you worship any false god, you're worshiping the things of this world, you're worshiping the forces of nature, you're worshiping the principles of this world, and this world is a sick and dead and dying world. Last night I was reading about, uh, there's a guy named Studs Terkel. And he was a writer in Chicago uh, back in the 80s. And it was like reading last week's newspaper. Because he's, what Studs Terkel did was he would go and interview people, just ordinary people. Uh, a janitor who works in the high-rise project in uh, Chicago. He would interview uh, uh, some guy who is a uh, uh, air conditioner technician who comes around and fixes the air conditioners. And so he's talking to this one guy who lives in the projects. And the kid was saying how that him and his friends were with this girl and she was drunk. And they said, take the girl home. So him and his friends started to carry this girl home. Well, to get this girl to her house in one project, they had to pass through the territory of this gang, one of the many gangs in Chicago. 
And passing through their territory was enough that they started following them. When they got into an elevator, I guess the elevator was really small, but he says, I couldn't believe how many people were in the elevator. It was like four or five people. And all of a sudden, one of the, one of the gang members, I guess they must have had pistols, because they ran out of bullets like in five or six shots, but he stepped up and just, they start firing into this elevator where these people are. And the kid said, the gun, there was a gun to his head at one second, somebody hit the arm of the guy, and I guess he shot him in the chest. He fell down, and he said, all I could see was the room, the, the elevator was full of light. And I was just asking God to let it stop, and I couldn't wait for it to stop. And the first guy emptied his gun, another guy stepped up, started firing into this elevator, emptying his gun, and he said it just seemed like it went on forever. They just emptied their guns into the elevator. And he was bleeding, asking people to pray for him. He finally lived. But all I could think of was, that's 1980, and every weekend in Chicago, in Baltimore, you name the city, it's just like that. It's a shooting gallery, it's a zoo. That's the world we live in. You worship the gods of this world, you worship the things of this world, that's the future you're worshiping. That's the life God says, I don't want you to live down here in this world like that forever. I want you to see what it's like when there's no God. I want you to see what it's like when men take over, when women take over, when they're in charge, when they put God on hold, get him out of the way, and they take over. That's what the world looks like. That's the kind of life we have. We've got, what, how many diseases going on? <laughs> We're tracking this COVID thing, right? We don't even talk about the flu season, which every year, how many thousands of people, sometimes up to 100,000 or more, die of the flu. Do you know that when you get in your car to go home, you are entering a danger zone that makes that COVID virus look like nothing? Look up how many Thousands and thousands of people die every year in automobile accidents. But we're not parking our cars. When I first came here, every house on the block probably had two cars. Now, every house on the block's got three. And they're up and down. But we don't think anything like it. We don't think anything of it, because that's just the way it is down in the world, right? And God says, you know what? I don't want you to live like that. You got me used to living in hell. You've got used to living in a fallen world. I have something better for you. Trust me, the one who you can't see, rather than the things of this world that you think will bring you to the promised land. Elijah said, I'm the only one of the prophets left. But Baal, the God of this world, He's got 450 prophets. So you get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves. And they'll cut that bull into pieces, set it on the wood, but don't set fire to it. I'll prepare the other bull all by myself. You got 450 prophets. I'll do this all by myself. Me against you and your 450. Then you call on the name of your God, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he'll, he is God. The people said, what you say is good, let's do it. Choose one of the bulls, prepare it. You go first, Elijah said. Call on the name of your God, but don't light the fire. They took the bull given them, and they prepared it. They call in the name of Baal from morning to noon, all 450, dancing, chanting, praying, worshiping the gods of this world. Come and bring us relief. Come and bring us help. Prove to the world that you're God and not this puny, miserable nation of Israel, this small, hated group who through all history are going to be squeezed, minimized, made to be nothing, the very ones, God, that you said, Israel, you know why I chose you? 
I didn't choose you because you were the biggest nation of all. I chose you because you were the littlest nation of all. You were the least significant. You were next to nothing. Do you know why I chose you, Israel? Do you know why I chose you, Phyllis Arthur? Do you know why I chose you, Sally? Do you know why I chose you, Al? Same answer. You're better than everybody else in the world? Sally nods yes. No, that's not. <laughs> because I love you. That's what God said. I choose you because I love you. I have you down in this world because I love you. I created the breath that you breathe, the air you breathe, everything you have. I put it all here because I love you. They dance around. From morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. There was no response. No one answered. They danced around the altar they had made. They called out to the gods of this world for help, but the gods of this world will never help. The gods of this world will come and, answer and offer you immediate prosperity. The gods of this world will come and offer you immediate satisfaction. The gods of this world will say, send us for this pill, and you'll have pleasure like nobody else. You'll live in the penthouse. Everything you want will be yours. They'll flock to you. You just send in the money, and we'll see that you get whatever it is you want. And it never works. It leads you into a hole. It leads you into a trap. It leads you into a place where you start relying on something that can never deliver. And when the clock runs out, what do you find yourself? Trapped, addicted, lost, sinking, wishing there was a way out. The gods of this world will never deliver. They will never set you free. They will never bring you out. You name what the God of this world is. Anything short of God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ, will never, ever set you free. Only God, who created the heavens and the earth, can get you out of the hole you're in. There was no response. Yeah, because they're not God at all after all. They danced around the altar they had made, and at noon Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a God. Come on, call on Baal. Maybe he's deep in thought, you know, like the thinker. Maybe he's gone to the outhouse. Now we're trying to figure out what to do. Right? Or maybe he's busy traveling. Maybe he's asleep. We gotta wake him up. So they shouted louder, and they slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Surely when Baal sees the blood flow, he'll know how serious we are. He'll know how sincere we are. Surely when the gods of this world, when whatever it is that's trapped us, when we put more into the hole that we've dug, when we keep digging deeper, when we keep sinking lower, somehow we'll finally hit gold, right? They shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. No, there never will be a response, and there never will be an answer, because these aren't gods. You know what's gonna get you out of the hole you're in? You know what's gonna give you life and sustain you? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And make a genuine commitment to serve that God. A commitment like it's something that I'm going to build my life on. Not a commitment like, eh, come see, come saw. I'll throw my hat in the ring, take a break, take a nap, go out to a farm. No. When you mean business, you get on the rack, you stay there, and you don't walk away, and you work at it, and you work at it, and you hit it, and you hit it, and your child is sick with some disease or some sickness that you can't do anything about. What do you do? 
you find out what it means to pray without ceasing. You don't come and go, you don't take it lightly because the most important thing in your world is on the line and you dig in and you keep digging. You do that with God and I promise you, you will find a life that's worth living. You'll find a per you'll know what it means to have a relationship with Him. They won't just be words coming from a pulpit. They won't be just words that are in a book. They won't be just something that uh, looks nice in the daily bread. But it'll take root right here. But it'll never take, right, take root right here until you decide once for all. I love the story of Billy Graham, you know, the great evangelist. I've told you this before, but it's a great story. I can't, Gary Templeton was this man he was working with in their Youth for Christ Crusades in the 50s. And uh, they had tremendous response. You know, Billy Graham, I mean, he started out with these tent meetings and they, were, they, they didn't have a tent meeting for three weeks. They were there for three months. And tremendous crowds came and people just flocked because Billy Graham, and if you read Billy Graham's sermons, you could have written them yourself. They're not complicated. They're just the straight old gospel. And Billy Graham and Gary Templeton worked. Well, Templeton thought, geez, I need some more education. Went to Princeton. And the professors there taught him to doubt the Bible. Taught him to doubt God. Taught him to doubt the supernatural. Taught him that, Gary, if you can't touch it, you can't smell it, you can't see it. You can't hold it. Then don't believe in it. And you know what that leaves you? What we are standing on right now, terra firma, hard earth. That's all you have left is this world. And this world is dying. This world is a place where they're shooting each other up in Chicago this weekend, just like they did in 1980. Oh, well, we should take the guns. The guns are more illegal there than they were anywhere else in the world. They got the strictest gun control laws in the world. Who are you going to take the guns away from? They're already illegal. We make them double illegal, triple illegal. What should we do? Take them away from law abiding citizens? It's a quagmire. That's the world we live in. When all you have left is this world, then all you have left is what you have in here. And what you have in here can't get you to where this place can get you. You've got to have it in your heart. Gary Templeton started talking to Billy Graham about how the Bible wasn't really to be trusted. Why, there's other history books that contradict what the Bible said. Do you know that we've dug up things? And, you know, just imagine if in 4,000 years they dug up German, what would be left here? And of what you pick out of the floor or the ground here in German, of all that's left, you start trying to put the puzzle together and try and figure out what life was like back here in German, you know, two, four thousand years ago. And if you've got seven puzzles of a thousand puzzle piece, of a thousand piece puzzle, you ain't got much to go on. So he doubts the Bible. Billy Graham says, geez, what am I going to do? I don't have the education this guy has. He went out in the woods. He kneeled down in a stump or a log. And he said, God, I've got to make a choice. He said, Lord, I don't understand everything. I don't have all the knowledge in the world. But I choose today to trust you. And I choose to trust your word. And I'm going to stand on it. And I'm going to live by it. And I'm going to walk with it. And here I stand. You never heard of Gary Templeton. Unless you were alive back in the day. Or unless you know the story I just told. But you all know about Billy Graham. And there's thousands of people in the kingdom of God. Because that man who God supernaturally gifted. Beyond what nature can give. Billy Graham, you cut his arm off, just like you and me. That thing just bleeds until whatever. Regular human being, Elijah the prophet, 
regular human being, all the frustrations and disappointments we have, but gifted by God to do certain things. Well, Elijah said to the people, you come here to me. They came and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. You know the God that you decided you don't need anymore because you've got Baal. He's in charge of the rain. He's in charge of watering the crops. He's in charge of prosperity. He sends lightning and thunder at his will. We've got ancient things they dug up of the god Baal with a lightning bolt in his hand, like Zeus, right? Well, you just called on him, and he didn't show up. Okay. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come. And he said, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two sands of seed. In other words, about 24 pounds of seed in this trench. He arranged the wood, cut the bowl in pieces, laid it on the wood. Then he said, Now fill four large, large jars with water. You pour it over that bowl and over the wood. Do it again, he said. They did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. They did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar, even filled the trench. And at the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Israel, not the God of Jacob. Remember Jacob, the supplanter, the sneak? He wrestled with God. And he prevailed. And God said, now your name is going to be Israel because you've struggled with God and you've come out ahead. That's that commitment. That struggle is that commitment we're talking about. That's Billy Graham and the tree stump saying, God, I don't know everything, but I'm going to trust your word. And that man found life. Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God. And that you're turning their hearts back again. The fire fell, burned up the sacrifice, that drenched, soaked, tree time dumped the wood, the stones, and the soil, and it licked up the water in the trench. The people saw this, they fell, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Let's just close this out with the next few things out of the next chapter. Jezebel said, I wanted that man's life who just killed my prophets. And the Bible says Elijah was afraid. Yeah, the guy who just called fire down from heaven. The guy who just challenged the 450 prophets of Baal face to face and destroyed them, overcame them, humiliated them, and in God's name called down fire from heaven. And now he is afraid. Does that resonate in your heart? Do you know that when you walk with God, you don't lose your humanity? See, this is why faith is so important. It's easy to believe in God when the fire is before your eyes, when the fires fall, when the person is healed and stands up and walks. Everybody has faith. But what about when God says, you're going to have to wait. The healing's not going to come. I'm not healing who? Until I take them home. You're going to have to start out from fresh. You're going to have to make a new life. You're going to have to find your way. But I'm going to do it with you. You trust me and we'll walk together. We'll trust You trust me in the life that I gave you that you wish you still had. I'll give you a new life. Right? It's easy to trust God when everything happens the way you want. You know what Elijah prayed when he sat down under the broomstick? You know what he prayed? I wish I would die. I, the prophet Elijah, 
who just challenged the prophets of Baal and sent him home humiliated, actually slaughtered all 450 of them. I wish I could die. I'm afraid. That should resonate in your heart. You and I are human beings. God calls us to faith when we wish we would die. That's real faith. Like I said, when the healing comes, some people, if the healing doesn't come, bye-bye, this doesn't work. Real faith that digs in, that sits down on the log and says, God, here and now, I stand and I'm not quitting. What's the book of Revelation say again and again? It's the one who perseveres, who inherits the kingdom of God. Not the one who knows the Bible from cover to cover. Not the one who has all the answers. Not the one who calls down fire from heaven. Not the prophets who come and say, Lord, we've done wonderful works in your name. And God said, I never even knew you. No, it's the one who puts their faith in God and his son, Jesus Christ, and digs in and holds on. And when the winds blow and when the storm rises, you hold on for all your worth because this is all there is. This world is dead and dying. But Jesus Christ will never leave you, never forsake you, even under the end of the earth. You ask the people sitting around you who have lived through their personal hells. And they'll tell you, he won't let you down. Oh, it won't be easy. You'll be afraid. And with Job, you'll say, Lord, I don't understand this. And with Elijah, you say, I wish I could die. God will carry you through. Let's pray. We'll pick this up next week. Lord, thank you for your holy word. Because again, Father, we are ordinary people down here. We need your help. We need your strength. Lord, this world is not our home. It's not where we belong. A place where there's viruses and so we have to wonder whether or not we have to wear masks and then maybe we should wear a face shield and then maybe we should wear goggles and then maybe we should never go out of our houses again because there's bad things out there. Or maybe we shouldn't walk through that block because somebody's going to put a bullet through our shoulder or through our head. Maybe we should just quit and wrap it up and go home. Father, you have better things for us. The Holy Spirit will come into our life here in this world and give us the light of the kingdom. That boy that laid on the floor of that elevator and he said it was full of light. Everybody else in the elevator said, no, it wasn't. It was broken. The lights were all out. It was dark. Our Father, speak to our hearts that in the midst of a dying and dark world, we see light. That in the midst of a blind world, we see clearly. Speak to our hearts. That's where victory comes from. Father, give us the guts, the courage, the faith, the trust, the hope that we hang in there when the winds blow hard and when the water gets deep and when we don't see where relief could ever come from. That of all times is the time to hang on. The still small voice will be heard soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's turn in our hymnals to uh, 393. Let's all stand as we sing.